وما أنزلنا عليك الكتاب إلا لتبين لهم الذي اختلفوا فيه وهدى ورحمة لقوم يؤمنون رب الشحل صدري ويسر لي أمري وحل العقدة من لساني يفقه قولي أمين يا رب العالمين Today إن شاء الله تعالى I'll be talking to you briefly about three problems three observations first that I have noticed in the last 15 years of trying to teach Muslims uh, about the Qur'an uh, and what has basically been my motivation for trying to d address issues in the Qur'an the way in which that I do. I think a lot of you in the audience are familiar with at least one or two of my lectures and probably finished half of them before falling asleep. But if you have heard enough lectures or heard one or two of them, then I'd, I'd just like to give you an overview of what is behind the scenes of these talks and this effort and this study. The first attitude that I have noticed among many, many Muslims, uh, and before I noticed it in anyone else, it was actually an attitude that I had myself. So I know that it exists because it's personal. Is that the Quran is not relevant. That the Quran is not talking about my life. It's talking about something that happened a long time ago. The people that I know that talk about the Quran look like they belong 500 years ago. They don't look like modern people. Uh, these people, when they speak, they speak in a way that nobody else speaks. My friends don't talk like this. My colleagues at work don't talk like this. My, my professors at school don't talk like this. As soon as, and it, as a matter of fact, you could be friends with a khatib. And when you're talking to them, they talk to you perfectly normally. But as soon as they get up on the mimbar, they talk differently. They talk like there's, they belong in a different time. And it becomes almost disconnected from you. So the first impression I had of religious conversation, Qur'an, Sunnah, the whole bit, the whole thing, was that this does not belong in this time. This is some old thing, and this is for people that are old-minded. You cannot have this religion and live in modern times. You cannot combine those two things. It's impossible. That's number one. And as a matter of fact, even in so many lectures that I heard, all they talked about was how bad these times are and how good the old times used to be. That's all they talk about, is these times are very bad, and old times were very, very good. And so I say to myself, well, old times are over, so I guess it's bad now, so what's the point? <laughs> That's the first problem. The second problem I noticed, again, something I noticed in myself, and then I noticed it in now millions of other people, is that this religion and this book is extremely strict, and it's harsh and it's difficult, and it has rules that are not easy. The rules of this book, the guidelines of this book, that it tells you to do some things that you're not supposed to do, or it, it forbids you from some things, or it commands you to other things, but its rules are too many, and too heavy, and too difficult, and basically impractical. You can't do it. You just can't do it. If you have to do it, you have to be a very extreme person. You cannot be a normal, happy person and do these rules. As a matter of fact, the more religious you get, the more depressed you get, and the more angry you get, and the more angry you look. So all the religious people I know are really angry people. So I don't want to be like that, so that must be because of this religion. This religion is harsh, so it makes people harsh. It makes people difficult. It makes people very angry. As a matter of fact, in my own life, before I turned to the deen of Allah, I was born a Muslim, but you know, you know how it is. If I saw a guy with a beard, I ran the other way. I do not want to be around those guys, because they keep telling me how I'm going to hell. Or they're just going to tell me to do something, like go make salat. Or, hey brother, why do you have this? Why, do you, why are you dressed like that? What are you listening to? What are you watching? What are you... Stop. I don't want to talk to you. Just leave me alone. Let me eat pizza. You know, 
You're, you're sitting there relaxing, eating your pizza. The guy with the beard walks into the restaurant. You're like, oh, God. <sighs> I was enjoying my meal. This guy had to come in here. You know? So the, the religion is harsh, and people that follow the religion are also harsh. That was the second attitude. The third attitude was that every time I hear, or at least most of the times when I heard people talk about the deen of Allah, they did not tell me why I should be Muslim. They did not tell me why I should be Muslim. They only told me that I should be Muslim. Here's what you should do. And if I said, why should I do it? They said, because you're going to burn in hell if you don't do it. Why should I believe I shall burn in hell? Don't question why you should believe you'll burn in hell. You're a kafir if you question. You have doubts? You don't have iman? And if you go to the, the person who gave you that lecture and you say to them, so how do we know, how do we know for sure that this is the right religion? How do we know? I mean, there's so many religions in the world. How do we know that we have the right religion? The shaykh will tell you, and he told me, you son, you need to make wudu, then you make, need to make two rak'ah, because you're getting muswasa from shaitan. After I make wudu, and I make two rak'ah, I still have the same question. Why are we following this religion? Every time I ask that question, people say, Astaghfirullah al-Azim, how can you ask that question? You're not supposed to ask that question. Inna lillahi wa inna ilayhi. Do your parents know about this? Akhil Kareem, sit down, sit down. Let me do some ruqya on you. <laughs> but then after the ruqya is done, I still have the same question. So you know what I started thinking? And millions of young people around the world started thinking? These people don't have an answer to that question. These people, number one, they want you to live like you live that this... They don't want you to live in 2015, they want you to live in 1275. They want you to live in the time of Umar ibn al-Khattab anhu. That was number one, it's irrelevant for this time. Number two, they're extremely harsh. And number three, they don't want to answer my questions. They think my questions are evil. These three reasons are enough, more than enough, for someone to want nothing to do with Islam. If you have these three concerns, and you want nothing to do with Islam, I appreciate that, I understand. It's logical. And I can tell you, with a good degree of confidence, I have not been to any country in the world, Muslim or non-Muslim, where there are not people who think exactly like this. For all the people who come and sit in a lecture, there are hundreds and thousands, if not millions of people, Muslim and non-Muslim who have this problem. They have this problem. And so this is what I noticed for so long. And I stayed away from the Qur'an for so long in my life for one reason. It doesn't have to do with my time. It's harsh. It's not going to answer my questions. How are my questions? I have questions. I went to college in New York City. I took a philosophy class. And in philosophy class, and in psychology class, and in anthropology class, when, I've, when I'm studying Freud, when I'm studying you know, evolution, when I'm studying you know, modern European philosophy, how is a book 1400 years ago going to answer my questions? Come on, seriously? It's not going to have answers to my questions. You know? So I have no reason to go to this book. But by the gift of Allah, for no other reason, when I did stumble upon the book of Allah, when I st did start to decide to try to understand the book of Allah, and I was fortunate enough to find some incredible, incredible teachers, I realized all three of those things were untrue. The book is incredibly relevant. The book has answers to my questions and my problems and my personal problems today. Forget about society's problems and the world's problems. That's, second, that's stage two and stage three. I'm talking stage one, my personal problems. It has answers. The second issue was it's harsh. The more I studied the book, I realized people are harsh, but the book is not harsh. Allah sent the book as a rahmah. 
but we don't have rahmah. So when we talk about the book, we talk about the book, but we take out the rahmah. <laughs> That's what we do. Allah's book doesn't do that, we do that. Okay, we're intolerant. We're intolerant. And well, I'll talk about that a little bit later, some more. And then the third problem was that, it, you know, people don't want to answer my questions. I have questions and they say, Astaghfirullah, this is from shaitan. But the Qur'an says, Hatu burhanakum in kuntum sadiqeen. The Qur'an is inviting people to ask questions and bring their criticisms. Which religion in the world says, please, criticize? No other religion other than Islam. Please, we would invite you to question and criticize this book. I'm reading this and I'm saying, how can a book do that? I thought this book is supposed to tell me, just believe. And if you don't believe, you will burn. But this book says, no, think for yourself. No other religion tells you to think. Actually, every other religion tells you, stop thinking and just believe. Stop thinking and just believe. And this book says, you cannot stop thinking. You have to think, and if you think, only then you will believe. There's no other religion like that. So I realized at the age of 19 that I had been cheated by the Muslim Ummah. I felt cheated. I had been Muslim my entire life, and nobody told me that this book actually has the answers, that this book is actually relevant, that this book isn't harsh. So the people around me that I thought will teach me the religion of Islam, they misrepresented its teachings. Personally, I felt very offended. I lost a lot of trust. I did. I didn't trust these people. I wanted to learn it for myself. I, I, I'm, not say, I'm not blaming everybody who teaches the deen of Allah, but enough people. <laughs> enough people. And I was fortunate enough to find some incredible, incredible teachers, scholars, that actually, in my opinion, understood the deen in the spirit that it's supposed to be understood. But these people are very few. And you know what, what else? These teachers that I'm talking about, they're not good speakers. <laughs> you have to go to them and learn from them. But if, they, if I show you a YouTube video of theirs, you'll go to sleep. So you have to go to the And the people that misrepresented Islam to me, they were very good speakers. They were very good speakers. They're widespread. This is a problem. We keep talking about doing da'wah to non-Muslims. I am here to tell you, the ummah itself is disconnected from the Qur'an. And actually, a lot of times, when the people are hearing about the Qur'an, they are hearing a message that is harsh, that is irrelevant, and that does not answer their questions. Even though the Qur'an answers the questions, the person presenting it doesn't present it that way. And so we are misrepresenting, or under, no, let's not say misrepresenting, we are under-representing the Book of Allah. We are under-representing the Book of Allah. That is the problem that I see before me. That's the challenge of our time. That to me is the biggest challenge of our time. Things are said about the ayat of Allah. The easy, it's easy to quote an ayah of Qur'an, very easy, it's not difficult. And it's also extremely easy to misuse an ayah of the Qur'an. It's very easy. And people do it. And you know what? Sometimes people misuse the ayat of Qur'an and innocent people die. This Qur'an, if you misuse it, it will not just create fasad on the earth. It will create, you know, wayas fi dima, the angels had a concern. It'll spill blood. The Qur'an can be used or misused to spill blood. And it's happening. The Qur'an can be misused to push people away from Islam. It's happening. It's happening in our time. People are reciting, the people that are talking about Qur'an, they're talking about it in a way that even the Muslim says, I don't want Islam anymore. I want to walk away from it. This is the tragedy of our time. Now, that was the tragedy part. I'm going to stop talking about the tragedy now. You heard enough about the tragedy. Now I'm going to start over. I'm going to talk to you about an ayah of the Qur'an. Wallahu anzala min as Allah, in fact, He is the one that sent water from the sky. Allah is talking about rain, yes? Now bear with me. فَأَحْيَا بِهِ الْأَرْضَ بَعْدَ مَوْتِهَا Then He gave life to the earth after the earth was what? 
the earth was dead. Allah gave life to the earth after the earth was dead. What did Allah use to give life to the earth? Water. In the example, Allah gave water to the earth, and that, that way the dead earth comes back to life. Without the rain, does this planet survive? This planet cannot survive without rain. That is the life of this planet. Everybody clear about that? Okay, now let's move forward. يُنْبِدُ لَكُمْ بِهِ الزَّرْعْ وَالزَّيْتُونَ وَالنَّخِيلُ وَالْأَعْنَابُ وَمِنْ كُلِّ الثَّمَرَاتِ Both of these ayat belong to Surah An-Nahl. Allah produces for you, by using the water, Allah produces two kinds of things. Let me categorize two kinds of things. He produces farm and, you know, zaytun. You know what zaytun is? Good, olive, very good. And then what What's nakhil? Sisters know Arabic vocabulary. Guys are getting some good sleep. Like. I knew that one. When, well, Arnab? Three zero. Arnab. Women kulit tamarat. Four zero. All kinds of fruits. Now listen. On the one hand, you have farm and palm trees and grapes. These things don't grow by themselves. You have to take care of those trees and you have to grow a farm. A farm does not happen by itself. You have to put a lot of work into a farm for it to grow properly. You understand? No. Okay. Huh? And white right. So now when Allah says all kinds of fruits, when He says all kinds of fruits, now if you go into like the South, South American jungles, or you go into Afri the Africas, will you see all kinds of fruits on the trees? Yeah, all kinds of fruits. But th are there farmers in those jungles? No, it goes on its own. What Allah is telling us is, He sends water from the sky, and when He sends water from the sky, there is some kind of fruits or vegetation that people have to farm. You have to take care of those plants. Unless you take care of them, they will not grow. And then there are some plants and some fruits that will grow on their own with no effort from you. That's out in the wild, yes? Two kinds of life on the earth come out from the rain. You understand the point so far? Okay. But actually, remarkably, the ayah that I shared with you, Wallahu anzala minas sama ima'an, is not actually about the water and the sky. That's its second purpose. Its primary purpose is dictated by the ayah that came before it. And the ayah that came before it is, وَمَا أَنزَلْنَا عَلَيْكَ الْكِتَابَ إِلَّا لِتُبَيِّنَ لَهُمْ أَلَّذِ اخْتَلَفُوا فِيهِ وَهُدًا وَرَحْمَةً لِقَوْمٍ يُؤْمِنُونَ The previous ayah says, Allah sent the book from the sky. In the next ayah, he said, Allah sent the water from the sky. So if you want to understand the effect of the book of Allah on the earth, if you want to understand the effect of the book of Allah on the earth, you have to understand the effect of water on the earth. You understand? Now, what does water do? Water brings life to the earth. Is it essential for the survival of the earth? Yes. So, if the water is essential for the survival of the earth, the book of Allah properly delivered to all the places that are morally dead, that are spiritually dead. It has to be delivered properly, because rain has to come properly, especially to the places that are dead. It has to go to those places, and even if they have been dead for centuries, it will bring them back to life. So no matter how bad the situation is, no matter how dead the earth is, when water can bring the earth back to life, no matter how bad the political situation of the world is, no matter how bad the moral situation of the world is, how, no matter how bad the media is in any day and age, no matter how low the Muslims have become, this book has the power to bring people back to life. It has the power to do that. You understand? But when the water comes down, when the water comes down, there are two kinds of plants. Plants that grow on their own, and plants that you have to what? Are there people in the world that we ne I never met them. I never met them. I just made a YouTube video. 
And then they come to me and say, hey, I used to be Christian. I saw your video. I became Muslim. Then I told my family, and they became Muslim. Can we take a picture with you? I was like, yeah, can I take a picture with you? Did I do anything with them? No. That was the word of Allah somehow reaching them and they on their own grew. Yes? That is not because of our effort, that is because Allah grows in Iman in the heart of whoever He wants. All I had to do was do a little bit, little bit, but Allah will spread it Himself. Allah will spread, actually about the rain, He says something beautiful. You are not the one who sends the water down. You're not the one who delivers it to the earth. I am not the one who will deliver the word of Allah into somebody's heart. I can only try to make some effort. The actual delivery is happening just like the rain. By who? By Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. But there is one very important difference. Please understand this difference. Water comes from the sky. Yes? And is there, does water come to the sky in one bucket and then you have to go deliver it? Or it goes everywhere on itself? It goes by itself. But when book, the book comes from the sky, it goes to one messenger. It comes to one man. And then he has to make the effort to what? Deliver it. And then the people he delivers it to, they have to, to make the effort to what? Deliver it more. Allah will not send the book to everyone. We have to deliver it. So un we have some similarity with the rain. The Quran has similarity with the rain. But there's a difference. The rain, we don't go and distribute it. By the way, if you made the Muslims responsible for distributing the rain on the earth, we would be an extinct species. <laughs> but we are responsible for delivering the word of Allah to the earth. Are we doing a good job? I would argue no. I would argue we're doing a pretty terrible job. I would argue we're doing a pretty terrible job even with Muslims. Forget non-Muslims. Because we make it seem harsh. We don't make it... The rain is supposed to be rahmah, not adab. But we present it as adab. Even ask a 10-year-old boy, a 10-year-old girl, living in Pakistan, living in Bangladesh, living in Kuwait, living in Bahrain, living in America, living in Australia. A 10-year-old Muslim boy. What does the Quran say? Quran says lots of things are haram. And Allah gets very angry. Where did they learn that from? Their parents. We, we teach harshness from the beginning. We heard the recitation. Allah introduced the teaching of the Qur'an with which name? Ar-Rahman Allam al-Qur'an Fa'ayna ar-Rahma fi ta'lim al-Qur'an You know, this is the problem. It's a very serious problem. So we have to address this issue. Now, on the one hand, people will come on their own to Islam like wild fruits. And they're amazing. They're amazing people. But that does not mean da'wah is happening. Because we didn't do the farming. On the other side, there is the farm, yes? Now let me tell you something else. Very interesting. Allah gives these analogies. وَتِلْكَ الْأَمْثَالُ نَضْرِبُهَا لِلنَّاسِ وَمَا يَعْقِلُهَا إِلَّا الْعَالِمُونَ Examples are critical in the Qur'an. Examples are a fundamental of the Qur'an. Now, farming. Did you know that human civilization, human beings, in the study of anthropology, human civilization, the first act of human civilization was farming. And the argument is humanity would not have survived as a civilization. We could have survived in caves or woods or something, but as a civilization with cities and countries and infrastructure, none of that would have happened if we did not farm. And farming would never have happened if we did not deliver a means of uh, 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 irrigation, of channeling water. If you don't figure out how to channel water, you cannot farm. And if you cannot farm, you will not have civilization. Is that an important thing to understand in this conversation? If we don't understand how to deliver Qur'an, and if we don't understand how to cultivate people, then the Muslim civilization will cease to exist. It will die. Have previous nations that were given a book died before us? They have. It's not impossible. 
It's not impossible. The only thing is, if we don't do this job, Allah wants this job to get done. So if you are no good, in tatawallaw, yastabdil qawman ghayrakum, thumma la yakunu amthalakum. If you turn away, He will just replace you with some other people and they won't be, I'll use Urdu, they won't be nikamme like you. They won't be useless like you. They'll actually do the job. If we don't do our job, Allah does not need us. Wallahu al-ghani wa antum al-fuqara. You don't do your job, Allah will replace you. You are not special to Allah because you are, you know, uh, Muslims for centuries. You're not special to Allah. That means nothing. The Banu Israel are much older as an ummah than we are. Much older. <coughs> we have only been an ummah for 1400 something years. They were a chosen ummah for thousands of years. Thousands of years. And even then, even though they were so senior, when they turned away, did Allah replace them? Yep. Yep. You're not special, I'm not special. We can be replaced. The job is what is important, not you, not me. The job is important. Now let's talk about that job. My argument is that today, the only solution the only thing that can bring life back spiritual life, moral life, ethical life back to the Muslims and by the way by extension to the entire world because the entire world needs it the only thing that can bring life back to this earth is the book of Allah the humanity needs it. You know they have conventions about environmental crisis. They have conventions about political crisis. There are, you know, United Nations, uh, you know, charters. They meet about all kinds of humanitarian, drastic situations that are happening all over the world. The crisis situations in the world keep growing and growing and growing and growing. If you're watching CNN 24 hours a day, you are listening to human tragedy 24 hours a day. Human news is just tra tragedy. That's all it is which means the earth is dying. And Allah told us the only thing that can bring it to life and save its life is what? The Book of Allah. The problem though is some people who, are, who want to further kill are using the Book of Allah. <laughs> They're using the Book of Allah not to spread life but to spread death. To spread death. And they claim that they have the right understanding of the book of Allah. And I argue the following. Here's, why we, here's how we as an ummah have to fix this problem. Nothing, please listen to this carefully, it's going to sound politically incorrect. It's going to sound controversial. Some of you will be offended, but I don't care. لا نخاف في الله لو Nothing is above the book of Allah. وَكَلِمَةُ اللَّهِ هِيَ الْعُلِيَةِ Nothing is above the book of Allah. Unfortunately, in our times, sometimes you and I have an idea. We already have an idea. And now we want that idea to be justified by the book of Allah. So we develop our idea first, and then we find the leel in the book of Allah. What was on top? Quran or your idea? Your idea. And you put the ayat underneath it to justify the ayat of Allah are now being used to justify your philosophy. You are not extracting the philosophy and the thinking and the solution from the book of Allah. You already have the solution. You just want to justify it from the book of Allah. This is a disservice to the Qur'an. For example, there are people who talk about the mission of the Qur'an is da'wah. Where did you get this from? I don't know, but the mission of the Qur'an is da'wah. So if what, what, what about the ayat of talaq? What about the ayat of taking care of your parents? What about, no, no, yeah, those are important, but the real mission is da'wah. So you decide which ayat are the real mission and which ayat are the... Uh. How do you decide? Where did you come from? Who are you to put that rule on top of Allah's book? Da'wah is part of Allah's book's mission. It's not the only mission. It's not the only teaching. I was recently giving a khutbah on Surah Al-Mujadala and I said, look, every surah is a curriculum from Allah. Every surah is a khutbah from Allah, a sermon, a maw'idah from Allah, yes? 
And Allah knows what is most important, what is next, what is next, what is next. What He mentions first is the most important thing. Then He mentions what comes next, what comes next. Like any teacher does, the most important lessons come first. Surah Al-Rahman, we just heard the recitation. What's the most important part of Surah Al-Rahman? Al-Rahman al-Allam al-Qur'an. Everything else is what? Second. أَلَمْ تَرَى أَنَّ اللَّهَ يَعْلَمُ مَا فِي السَّمَاوَاتِ وَمَا فِي الْأَرْضِ مَا يَكُونُ مِنْ أَجْوَى ثَلَاثَةٍ إِلَّا هُوَ رَابِعُهُمْ وَلَا خَمْسَةٍ إِلَّا هُوَ سَادِسُهُمْ وَلَا أَدْنَى مِنْ ذَلِكَ وَلَا أَكْثَرَ إِلَّا هُوَ مَعَهُمْ أَيْنَ مَا كَانُوا Wait, najwa means people conspire against the Prophet ﷺ. People are conspiring sometimes to undermine the Prophet's mission. Sometimes they're conspiring, they're making conspiracy secret meetings to kill the Prophet ﷺ. That's a pretty serious problem. But in Surah Al-Mujadala, that is problem number what? Two. What was problem number one? A woman has a problem with her husband. What? No, no, no. Yeah, that's a spot. The real issue is Najwa. Who are you to decide? Allah teaches the way He wants to teach. I, I'm reminded of the question Allah asks in Surah Al-Hujurat. قُلْ أَتُعَلِّمُونَ اللَّهَ بِدِينِكُمْ Oh, you're going to teach Allah your deen? You're going to teach Him your deen? You decide what's more important. You know? So we, what we do is we take selections of ayat. These are the important ayat. These are the ayat that we have to have our curriculum with. The rest of Qur'an is secondary. Even if you don't say it, you're thinking it. And that thinking is problematic. We have to give justice to the Book of Allah. We have to give justice to a surah. We have to stop thinking that some things are important and some things are less important. There are some things that are in order. There's priorities. But those priorities are not decided by you. They're not decided by me. They've already been decided by Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. They have already been decided. Now think about this. Now, this is the last thing I'll share with you and I'm done. Then I just want to hear from you guys. When I was in New York, when I was not a religious person, I was a Muslim, not a religious person. When I first got exposed to Islam, the thing about New York is it's a crazy place. Every masjid has its own Islam. Literally, every masjid has its own Islam. You know, kullu hizbin bima ladayhim farihun. This is actually, I saw it in New York. Every group believes they are the right one and they will give you a lot of khutbah and a lot of lectures about how wrong the next door neighbor is. And then when you go to that one, they will tell you how perfect they are and how evil those guys are. And I have a problem that I like to go, when I learn something, I like to really learn it. So I go to group number one and I learn so much from them that I become part of them. And then I say, okay, I've learned enough. Now I'm going to go to group number two, and I'm going to learn so much from them, I'll become part of them. I know it's crazy, but I did that. <laughs> so I went from one group, to another group, to another group, to another group. I went through, I, I was a tourist. Okay? And when I was done, I realized something. I realized something. Every group decides one thing is the most important thing. And their entire picture of Islam is based on that one concept. One group says the most important thing is da'wah. Forget everything else. Another group says the most important thing is how you look. You should look a certain way. If you don't look like this, then you're not a good Muslim. Another group says, no, you have to have these, these books. If you don't go through these books, then you're not a good Muslim. You don't really know your Islam. And they're not talking about Quran, by the way. There are other secondary books. If you don't have those books, then you're not a real Muslim. Every group has certain curriculum. That's, the mo that's what defines their Islam. And not a single group said, you know, the curriculum for the Muslim should be what? The book of Allah. Wa kalimatullahi hiya al By the way, did every one of those groups quote something from the Quran? Yes. But that was, not, that was only to justify their position. And that was only to prove that the other guys are going to hell. That was the only reason. Why would Allah give us this book and say, وَاَعْتَصِمُوا بِحَبْلِ اللَّهِ جَمِيعًا وَلَا تَفَرَّغُوا فِي Why? This book, if you give it justice, it will cause union. And if you don't give it justice, it will cause division. We're not holding on the way we're supposed to. I'll tell you, you know, to make that last point that I just made, 
which was that we have to think beyond groups. We have to think of ourselves as Muslims. We have to think of ourselves as Muslims. And we have to bring normalcy back to the Ummah. The only way to do it is again putting the Book of Allah in its place, in its proper place. I'll tell you a small story. I was giving a lecture in Birmingham, England. And if you've been to Birmingham, England, uh, make a istighfar. But anyway, I was giving a lecture in Birmingham, England, and Birmingham is a very interesting place. The, the, there's a few masajid there, and every masjid is very different from every other masjid. These people hate each other's guts. The only time they agree with each other is when they have to get a halal burger. <laughs> other than that, they do not like to see each other's face. You know, they, don't, they completely hate one another. They're different schools of thought. I don't, I'm not here to name names. I, I know their names, the group names, but I don't care. I, I think that is so useless that I don't even bring, pull it out of my mouth. That's why I don't name those groups. Khair. So there was about 2,000 people in the audience. 1,000 to 2,000 people in the audience. And I was, giving an, I was explaining a, one of the stories from the Quran. And a young man and a woman came up to me. Salaman, can we talk to you for a second? I said, yeah. Uh, we are actually uh, Baha'i. We're Baha'i. You know, Baha'is believe in some really out there stuff. But they still consider themselves Muslims. We, we, we're Baha'i, and um, we really love listening to your lectures. It, helps us, it helped us change a lot. We didn't know the Quran says these things. We wanted to come here, but we're really scared. Because if people find out here who we are, I think there's going to be a problem. And we brought 20 of our friends here too. But we just want you to know quietly that we appreciate what you're doing. I was like, thank you. Thank you for letting me know. I'm really happy you're here. I'm done with that conversation. And the guy comes up, brother, I know this is a Sunni program, but I'm Shia. Is that okay? I was like, yeah, it's okay. Okay. Because my, my Shia friends and I, we listen to your lectures. I was like, that's cool. Keep it up. Very nice. Don't tell anybody. Yeah, I won't tell anybody. I got it. I got it. <laughs> I have had Christians come up to me and tell me. We've been watching your videos. I was in Canada. I was at an RIS convention. A group of Canadian women came up to me. Numinally can, right? I was like, yeah. <laughs> We're a group of Christian women. We've been studying the Quran for the last year with you. And we only came to this convention because we wanted to thank you. It's helped us change a lot. Christian women studying the Book of Allah. May Allah guide them. You know, if I was still wearing my group labels, those stickers from New York, as soon as I saw a Baha'i, I was like, hey, come here, let me talk to you, let me fix you. If I saw Christians, I would go straight after Jesus. If I saw the Shia, I would go straight after their aqaid and the ikhtilafat. Go, I would attack them right away. I would do that. But you know what? I understand something from the Book of Allah. We are supposed to be farmers. We are supposed to be what? Farmers. A farmer puts a seed in the ground. Then he puts water on top. Then he makes dua to Allah. Then he puts water on top. Then he cleans the soil. Then he puts the water on top. Then he makes dua to Allah. Then he removes the insects. Then he puts the water on top. Then he makes dua to Allah. And for months and months and months and months and months, he sees nothing. He sees nothing because the seed is where? Under the ground. And he doesn't get angry. Hey, why aren't you growing? Let me pull it on. Let me... That is not how things grow. You have to let things grow. All you have to do is provide the water. And Allah's responsibility, I don't grow a plant. Allah grows the plants. Allah grows the... Why did He give us this analogy? You have to spread the book of Allah and Allah will make the changes. You just have to spread the book of Allah. You're not responsible to change people. Lasta alayhim bi musaytir. You're not in charge. Stop pretending that you're in charge. So many people come up to me, brother, mashallah, you give some good da'wah. Tell me how I can tell my brother to start praying. Tell me what I can tell him. I was like, 
I don't know what to tell you. Because maybe you haven't put enough water, not put enough water yet. And maybe you're putting water, but some plants grow slowly and some plants grow quickly. It's not about what you say. It's how patient you are with people. It's how patient you are. Yusuf alayhi salam's sons, or Yaqub alayhi salam's sons, they disobeyed their father or no? They were a source of sadness or no? For years and years and years, they're a source of sadness. And at the end of it all, they make tawbah or no? They take their time, yeah? Some, some seeds take a long time to come out. Fasabrun jameel. Yaqub alayhi salam doesn't turn to Allah. Ya Allah, give me something I can say to my sons. So they can change. It doesn't work like that. It doesn't work like that. We are impatient with each other. We want changes to come like that quickly. If the best generation took 23 years, first of all, we're not the best generation. But if they took 23 years of exposure to this book, our challenge today is let's re-expose the people to the book of Allah like they've never experienced it before. So they can remove the assumptions that they've had about the Book of Allah. Non-Muslims have misconceptions about the Qur'an. And my conclusion is, Muslims have misconceptions about the Qur'an. We have to fix the misconceptions for the entire world. We have to show the, the world how beautiful, how remarkable, how incredible, how loving, how merciful, how addictive this book is. That's what we have to do. May Allah Azza wa help us do our job. And may Allah Azza increase our love and affection for the Book of Allah and the Sunnah of His Messenger Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam. Barakallahu li walakum. Thank you so very much for listening. Zakallahu khair. Yes, go ahead. Yeah. Sure. Okay. Okay. Um, if you guys, I mean, I could point you to books, but I don't like to give you advice that I wouldn't follow myself. I, I don't read much. I sleep a lot. So, and books help me sleep. So if you're really into reading, that's fine, but most people are not into reading anymore. They watch videos, especially young people, right? So we want to have as much interactive uh, learning available as possible. If you guys uh, think that what I have to offer is beneficial, then I humbly suggest two efforts that I've made that I think can really help uh, you start your studies in the Quran. The first effort is a course I, I taught called uh, Divine Speech. That's the first course, okay? Uh, it's about 16 hours long. So you can do it over the course of a month, little by little, or maybe even two months. The, there's only one point, every course should have a point. So let me tell you what the point of that course is. What's, what's the name of the course? Divine. Divine Speech. The only purpose of that course is to appreciate the Book of Allah. That's the only purpose. Why should I learn this book? What's so great about this book? It's only asking that, it's only answering that one question, why is this book so amazing? That's it. That's it. And it's there to answer some common confusions that Muslims have and non-Muslims have when they study Qur'an. For example, subjects change in the Qur'an very quickly. How come? There's a lot of repetition in the Qur'an. How come? The stories are repeated, a little bit over here, a little bit over there, a little bit over there. How come not put all of them together in one place? Why is it so spread out? How come the Qur'an is not in the order that it was revealed? So all these questions are logical questions. The problem is you don't get a chance to ask those and get logical answers. Divine speech is there to help answer those questions, get rid of those criticisms, and actually turn them into something beautiful. That's the first step to me. Appreciation comes before learning. Divine speech is actually about appreciation. Then we can start learning. Okay? The next step I would suggest is uh, a course I put together called uh, Quran for Young Adults. Even though I said young adults, if you are young at heart, it's okay. Okay? Um, so it's called Quran for Young Adults. And the purpose of that course 
is to give you an overview of some of the more the core concepts in the Quran. Some of the fundamental concepts in the Quran. How does Allah talk about belief? How does He talk about belief? How does He talk about good deeds? I spoke with some of you, I remember, outside uh, yesterday. We like to complicate things. Muslims love complication. Quran loves to simplify things. So we love discussing complex issues in aqidah over eight volumes. And Ibrahim alayhi salam keeps things very simple. You see what I'm saying? There's no complications with Ibrahim alayhi salam. And his, his, he by the way, he would not be able to take the aqidah test you would give him. Because it's simple for him, it's straightforward. And he is the, we are the religion of his, him. Millat abikum Ibrahim. We have to learn to keep things simple. And how do we learn that? Through Quran. It addresses all the major philosophical challenges. It addresses all the questions and confusions. But it does them in a way that the prophets did them. We have our own curriculum. I say we replace our curriculum with Allah's curriculum. First, you can do the second curricula if you want. You want to go do a PhD in Aqidah? Fine, do it. But do it as step two. Step one, just learn the Iman of Ibrahim salam. Just learn the Iman taught through Fatiha. This is Allah's curriculum on your belief. This is Allah introducing Himself to humanity. Why is this not enough? Why do you think this is not enough? No, 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 I studied Fatiha, but I really want to refine my aqidah. What are you talking about? What are you talking about? Then people say, Akhi, if you don't study the complexities of aqidah with a shaykh, then you're not going to have the right aqidah. Let me ask you something. Let me ask you two questions. When uh, you, you guys know Rasul was reciting Quran and some jinn passed by. وَإِذْ صَرَفْنَا إِلَيْكَ نَفَرًا مِنَ الْجِنِّ يَسْتَمِعُونَ الْقُرْآنِ Did these jinns have an ijaza in tajweed or a degree in sharia or what do they have? Nothing. And did they study many years with Rasul Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam? No. They were just passing by and they heard what? They heard Quran. And then they were so amazed that they gave a speech. And their speech was so beautiful that Allah put it where? In the Qur'an, these are unqualified students of Iman that only heard the Qur'an for a few seconds and Allah values their words so much that we learn them. And then we write complicated tafsirs of them. <laughs> That's the funny part. You have uh, Ashab al-Kahf. Which day of the week we recite Surah al-Kahf? Every Friday. Every Friday, Sunnah. Ashab al-Kahf, do they have the correct Iman? Do they have the correct Aqidah? Are these people heroes of Islam or no? Absolutely. Who's gonna have, if, if, the, if Allah is proud of them, how can we say they don't have the right belief? These are standards for us. Especially in a time of fitna, we should remember them. That's the point. These people don't say a single prophet's name. These people don't make reference to a single book. They don't give dalil from a single ayah. They don't, have, they don't have any ijazah, they are not ulama, they are not fuqaha, they are not mufassireen, they are nothing. They don't even have a prophet among them. Nothing. All they say is, I don't think we should worship idols. I think we should only worship one God. Simple. And they became heroes to Allah, so He would put them in the Qur'an. Somebody gets mentioned in a book, it's a big honor. Somebody gets mentioned in the Qur'an, and it is, it is simple for them. We love complication. Allah teaches simplicity. That's why I'm saying you, if you bring it back to the book of Allah, things become easy, man. They just become easy. Now have you read this book? And then you have, have you read the, read the sharh of that book? Then you have, have you read the sharh of the sharh of the sharh of that book with the hashia? If you want to do that PhD in studies, in Islamic studies, go ahead. But that's not for the people. For the people is the book of Allah. For everybody else is the book of Allah. Ulama should go in depth. That's fine. But nothing else. That's what, what we mean when we say Kalimatullah al uliya That's what it means. It takes the first place. You begin with that. You know. فَبِذَلِكَ فَلْيَفْرَحُ Listen to these words. فَبِذَلِكَ fal. Yafrahu. Because of the Qur'an, because of that, they should be happy. Let me tell you, when you learn your deen, 
and you don't start with the book of Allah, you will end up learning something that will make you angry, and people around you will be angry when you're around them. You'll learn some angry version of Islam. When you begin with the book of Allah, it brings you joy, and it brings people around you joy. It makes you happy, it makes people around you happy. It's better than everything they're gathering. So it should be at the fundament. So I, I mentioned two courses. I've done a video explanation, a brief explanation for the entire Quran called Cover to Cover. That's that's available also, but that would be a step three. These two are these should keep you these two should keep you busy for at least a year. And then after that I'm not too worried. Inshallah. The first one you said divine speech, what was the next one? Second one is Quran for young adults. Quran for young adults. That's actually it answers questions like why should I believe? Why should I be Muslim? What, is it, what does Islam say about other religions? What is, you know, what are, what's going to happen to good people who die? Like, what's going to happen to Mother Teresa? You know? People have these questions. And I don't know, they're, well, easy, they're going to burn in hell. No, no, wait, hold on. Let's talk about this. Let's discuss this. Let's see how Allah deals with this question. So let's, let's you know, we have to bring nuance back, in-depth studies back of the Book of Allah. By the way, my, uh, if, you're in, if you're curious, uh, before you ask that question, I'll just tell you myself. If you're curious where I get my stuff from, like my sources, like how do I study Quran, I give a lecture, it's on YouTube called Ustad Norman's Study Methodology. My study methodology. I'll briefly mention now, I, my group and I, we go through about 26 tafsir per ayah. And we extract notes from them. And then we combine, we, we eliminate the redundancies. And we put the notes together. And then we review them. And then we go to, we have a research, uh, a scholar among us, who if, I, if there's an athar from a sahabi, like if it's Qawl ibn Abbas radiallahu ta'ala anhuma, or there's a hadith or sabab al nuzul or something, I go to him and say, is this sahih? Is this actually, is there, is there ikhtilaf on this qawl? Or is this, you know, muttafaq alayhi or something? He'll do his research, he'll get back to me, tell me this is actually not muttafaq alayhi, or this is, this is sahih, etc, etc. And then I put this, but I don't talk like that when I give a lecture, because that will kill you. That happens in the background. The lecture, the durus, the talks, they're supposed to be easy. But just because the talk is easy, doesn't mean the studies are supposed to be easy. The studies are supposed to be hard. And those of you that are learning Quran, please remember that. Learn the complicated stuff. But when you teach, keep it what? Keep it simple, keep it easy. That's really important. That's really, really important. So, br brother's turn, any questions? Yes, sir. Wa alaikum salam. Very good question, right. yeah. yeah. Whereas he is, uh, is, I think if you use he or she, okay? Then you're confining him to gender. Exactly, but Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is pure of gender. Sure, very good, right. very so good. Why we have used this question? Excellent. Question number one. Wait, let me answer question number one, because then I'll forget. Sure. Okay. Okay, good. So in English you have he, and you have she, and you have what? We. No, we don't have, you don't have we. You have he and she and it. Yeah? He, she, or it. Uh, he is for a male. She is for a female. What is it for? Non-living things, inanimate objects. Yeah? Okay. The Arabic language has two pronouns. It has hua and it has hiya. That's the two pronouns. Now, English works a certain way. Arabic works a different way. The problem that you asked is actually based on the fact that you asked an English language question. He. Which is a problem of the limits of translation. Let's talk about the Arabic language. Linguistically speaking, in the Arabic language, the, the pronoun hua, or the masculine pronoun, now let me tell you before I go on, there is a difference between male and masculine. I'll repeat myself. There is a difference between male and masculine. In Arabic, kitab, is masculine. Kitab is huwa kitab. It's masculine, but it's not a male. It's, male is about biology, you understand? Masculine is a grammatical concept. It's not a biological concept. 
Okay, so once again, masculine is a grammatical concept, but male is a biological concept. Now, in the Arabic language, huwa is masculine, and hiya is what? Feminine. And it can be used grammatically masculine, but it can also be used biologically for male. Huwa rajul, huwa ibni, you could use it for a male. Hiya can be used for grammatically feminine, which has nothing to do with biology. Hiya shams. Hiya shams. It is the sun. It's an it, but they use the word hiya because to them the sun is feminine. Okay? It's feminine. Mu'annath sama'i. Right? So now, that, if that much is clear, we can make our point. What's the point? Are you from, do you, are you from the technology industry by any chance? Yes. Okay. So you understand the concept of default? Yes, sir. Right? The default position in Arabic linguistics is masculine. So when something is neutral, then they use the masculine. And if something is gender specific, then they will transition out of the masculine and use the feminine. Now, huwa is used for Allah in the Quran. First of all, huwa is not being used as male, huwa is being used as what? Masculine, which means the masculine is not biological, it is grammatical. Why is it being used? Because that is the default position of the Arabic language. Very good. But uh, some of his wives, they, they didn't have a child. But yes. the relationship was a healthy one. Very good. So, so why do we call it like as well? Great why question. And why not Imra'ah? Okay. Really good question. Uh, before I answer the question, I'll give you a, a disclaimer. And the disclaimer is the lecture you heard is about 12 years old. I look the same. Uh, <laughs> uh, I learned a little more since the last 12 years. So this is the updated version of that question, okay? Um, let's begin with language. The word zawj is used not only for man and woman, it's actually used for anything that complements anything else. The sun and the moon are zawjain. The day and the night are zawjain. Okay? The male and the female are zawjain. Anything that completely complements anything else is called a zawj. Okay? So that's the first thing. So zawj is a comprehensive term which can include marriage, but is not limited to marriage. But it certainly does refer to something that is in complete complementary relationship to something else. Okay? Now, the use of the word zawj in the Quran certainly does indicate like a Sha'rawi rahimahullah among other scholars. This, by the way, this idea that I presented was presented by several ulama of the past. And the more recent uh, explanation that's made simple is by Sheikh Sha'rawi rahimahullah in his tafsir, which is uh, uh, you know, recorded now and, and documented. Khair. And the idea was that zawj is something like you mentioned, wholesome, complementary, the husband and wife get along and for good reason. They're, they get along and they do good together and they have kids in the marriage. And the example given was actually of, um, of Zakariya alayhi salam, right? وَوَهَبْنَا لَهُ يَحْيَىٰ وَأَصْلَحْنَا لَهُ زَوْجَهُ Right, so before he was called Imra'ati Aqiran, before the child Imra'a was used, after the child Zawj was used. Now, let's go further. There are the, there is something called divine intervention. Divine intervention. In the case of Adam alayhi salam, he was in Jannah, yes? How long do you live in Jannah? What's your lifespan in Jannah? Forever. You know, the only way your species can survive on the earth, the only way your name can survive on the earth, the only way your genes can survive on the earth is by having what? Children. But Jannah is a place where you survive. So the necessity, you know, any species on the earth cannot survive without what? Children. But in Jannah, the need for having children is not there. It's not there. So a marriage is already complete without children. You understand? So it's understandable that in, in Jannah, Allah Azza wa says, Ya Adam uskun anta wa zawjuka. It makes sense because it's already complete. It's in Jannah. In other words, when I say generally speaking, children and complementary, this is what makes a marriage whole in general cases. But there are exceptions. And those exceptions are actually noteworthy. It is the general rule that brings beauty to the exceptions. 
Now, what are the exceptions? You mentioned one of them. One of them is the, the Ummahatul Mu'mineen, right? Who didn't have children. And them not having children, especially not having boys, was actually an intervention made by Allah Himself. مَا كَانَ مُحَمَّدٌ أَبَا أَحَدٍ مِنْ رِجَالِكُمْ Number one. Number two, the, uh, the Rasul Sallallahu is the messenger and we cannot question him ever. And his wives are what to us? What are they to us? Ah, oh, so they have children. Yes? Allah calls them our? So the relationship is whole. Got it? All right. Yes? We have written, uh, written questions, yeah, written questions. But uh, written questions are so boring. <laughs> oh man, these are epic questions. Assalamu alaikum. Yeah, thanks. Pakistan. <laughs> uh, is that, um, is this, uh, you said, uh, who is it? Default, right? That's correct, yeah. So, uh, what about we? Like, we have sent um, in the Quran. So, uh, that's a You guys have great questions. You know, the answer is in this course I call Divine Speech, but I'll tell you anyway. Okay, that's why I really like that course, because all of these questions, I collected them and I made a course out of them. Okay, but well, let me give you something about that. Uh, inshallah, this will take seven or eight minutes, but I think you'll appreciate it. Okay. Why is we used for Allah in the. Quran. That's the question. First of all, let's begin with history. Uh, the Torah, the Hebrew Bible, that is still somewhat preserved with all of its editings, uses we for God in the Quran. We're not the only one. And I'm not talking about the Christians. I'm talking about the Jews. Do Jews believe God has a son? No. They don't. No, no, no. No, 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 no. Uzair ibn Allah is a very small fraction of Jews. The Arab fraction of Jews. The vast majority of Jews do not believe Uzair is the son of Allah. They do not. I, I talk to rabbis. I hang out with them. I debate Ibrahim alayhi salam with them. I know. Okay. Jewish scholarship, most of it does not acknowledge Uzair as the son of Allah at all. One fraction of it did, the fraction that lived in Arabia. Okay. But the Jewish tradition is much bigger than what was in Arabia. So Allah refers to some Jews who said that. Not all Jews who said that. Okay. So Christians specifically say God has a son, yes? But the Jews overwhelmingly say God does not have a son. But even they have what for, for God in their book? We. And I asked the rabbi, why do you have we? And he said, well, of course, God is royal. He's the king. And kings speak with the plural. Actually, not only kings speak in the plural, even presidents today speak in the plural. My, our president in the United States speaks in the plural. We in this administration have made blah, 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 blah. We won this election. We have made a... There's one guy, man. You, you and all your shayateen or what? What's, what's, the, what's the we for? But we is used for what? We is used for the, the collective. Now, next thing. This is important now. In the Quran, you will find dif different kinds of pronouns used for Allah. And to understand this problem logically, First, you have to understand what, is a, what are the different kinds of pronouns. There is third person, second person, and first person. Third person means he and she and they. I'll make you remember this because I'm not talking to myself. What is third person? He and she and they. Second person is you. Second person is you. What's first person? I and we. What was third person again? He, she, and they. And the second person is you. And the third per first person is what? I and we. Now in the Arabic language, there are six kinds of you. Anta, antuma, antum, anti, antun. There's like, you know, antuma is twice. So it's six kinds of you. You, both of you, all of you. You lady, both of you ladies, all you ladies. There's six yous. Okay, now. When in the third person, Allah uses he. Yes? In the second person, Allah uses anta, which is the singular you. Does Allah use they for himself? They? No. Does Allah use all of you for himself? No. He uses the singular third person, 
the singular second person. The only time he uses the plural is in which person? First person. And in first person you find ana and you find nahnu. Now, if this was actually plural, you should find it in the first person. You should also find it in the second person. And you should also find it in the third person. But do you? No, you only find it in the first person. Which means it's not literally plural. If it was literally plural, it would be all three persons. That's our first step to the answer. You, you with me so far? Okay? Because otherwise you would have found hum and antum and nahnu. It's not the case. That's just not the case. Now, the second issue. Nahnu is used, uh, let, let's talk about how Allah uses these persons. When Allah is being formal, <coughs> policies, or Allah is distancing Himself from a group of people, you will find the word He, Huwa, in the Qur'an. Why? Because the third person is the most distant pronoun. He's over there. He's over there. The He is used when it, there's a tab'id. Okay, in Balagha, there's tab'id. When, you, when He distances Himself, He uses He. Now we know where He's used. Where does He use Anta? He uses Anta when the slave of Allah talks to Allah. Anta maulana fansurna ala al kafirin. Okay? Innaka anta tawabur rahim. When the slave talks to Allah, he becomes close to Allah. So he doesn't say huwa, he says anta. He talks to Allah. So Allah gives us the opportunity to address him using anta. Then what's left? Ana and? Nahnu. I and we. I and we. Let me start with I. Because the question is, he should have always used I. Let me tell you, there's a king. Walillahi al-mathal al-a'la. I just want to get a point across. There's a king. Or there's a president. We have made certain policies. We have decided, da 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 da. And somebody starts talking during his speech. And he says, Excuse me, I'm talking. He doesn't say, Excuse me, we are talking. He says, Excuse me. Even though the rest of his speech was what? We, 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 we. And when he got angry, he did what? I. Okay, same president's talking. We made these policies. We sanctioned this. We provided this. And his baby walks by. Hey, come here, I love you. Everything was we, but what happened? I gets used when there's extreme case of love or extreme case of? Study the Qur'an, look for I. You'll find extreme love or extreme anger. You'll find tawbah. Ana tawabur rahim. Ana tawbah is an extreme act of Allah's love. You'll find fa inni u'adhibuhu adhaban la u'adhibuhu ahadam min al-alameen. I will torture him with a torture that I will never torture anybody ever with. That, what is that? That's anger. That's anger. Okay? Allah Azza wa Jal talks to Iblis. You refuse sajda? Idh amarnaka or idh amartuk? Amartuk. I commanded you. That shows the anger of Allah. Get it? So actually, Alhamdulillah, Allah does not use ana all the time. So we can know which places are extremely special. Like in Ramadan. Your dua being answered. لم يقول سبحانه وتعالى نجيب دعوة الداعي قال أجيب دعوة الداعي إذا دعان فإني قريب لم يقول إننا قريب إني قريب أجيب دعوة الداعي إذا دعان دعاني فليستجيبوا لنا لا فليستجيبوا لي وليؤمنوا بي لعلهم يشد كل هذا في المتكلم والمفرد all singular singular person first person all for love because Ramadan is a special love from Allah سبحانه وتعالى now, what's left? The question, the problem word, which is what? <laughs> Nahnu. Nahnu is used when Allah speaks in the role of a king, in the role of majesty. And when a king, especially when a king passes big policies or when a king gives you a lot of gifts, then he demonstrates his royalty. So you will find more overwhelmingly, when Allah talks about revelation of Quran, which is a great gift to humanity, you'll find Nahnu. Inna nahnu nazzalna dhikra wa inna lahu lahafidhoon Okay? Anzalna alaykal ma anzalna alaykal kitaba litashqa Okay? Anzala is used in cases 
where Allah demonstrates His majesty. But with Bani Israel, he was really angry because they should have accepted the Quran. So he says, وَآمِنُوا بِمَا أَنزَلْتُ مُصَدِّقًا لِمَا مَعَكُمْ Believe in what I sent down. وَلَا تَكُونُوا أَوَّلَا كَافِرٍ بِهِ Don't be the first to disbelieve. He wants I when he's extremely angry again. نَحْنُ for His majesty. Then Nahnu for when he sends water, you'll find Allah will be talking about he created the tree, he did this, he did this, and we sent water from the sky. He'll switch over to we because water is a special majesty from Allah. So you see, whenever water comes up, most of the time it switches over to we to demonstrate Allah's majesty. It's awesome. It's just so awesome. Here's the last part of this question. We, one of the, actually the most important concept in the book of Allah is the oneness of Allah. لَيْسَكَ مِثْلِهِ شَيْءٍ لَا إِلَهَ إِلَّا هُوَ الْوَاحِدْ الْأَحَدْ الَّذِي لَمْ يَلِدْ وَلَمْ يُلَدْ This is the concept of Islam. This is the concept of Islam. So then, how does Allah protect this concept even though the word نَحْنُ is there? At the end of all of our explanation, نَحْنُ is still plural, isn't it? Still plural. So how does he protect Tawheed after using Nahnu? Study Nahnu, we, for Allah, in the entire Qur'an, you will find something. Right before or right after, he will make sure that you learn that he is just one. Every time. Inna a'taynaaka al-kawthar. We gave you kawthar. Who gave you kawthar? We. The next ayah. Pray to us? No. Fasalli li. Rabbik. Let me call Fasalli Lana. Okay? So that you never forget that we is about one. So he switches immediately. Every time. Every time. Inna anzalnahu fi Laylatul Qadr. We sent it down in Laylatul Qadr, yes? Tanazalul Malaika. Finish the ayah. Tanazalul Malaika too. Aha. Bi idni na. Bidni, Rabb. Okay, now it's clear, it's just one Rabb. Get it? So ye, this, this is an amazing phenomenon in the Quran, the transitions of pronouns in the Quran. It's a remarkable study. This is absolutely a remarkable study. You have some really cool questions. I'll just take one more question. You Urdu ko sawal hai, Urdu ko jawab de do. Kise itraaz hai? Urdu mein poochh raha hoon kise itraaz hai Usse kya samajh aayegi Chalo khair kisi ko itraaz nahi hai Tumhye Urdu mein achha Dai ka farz mansabi kya hai Or khawateen pe ye kaam kis tarah Behter taur per Khawateen ye kaam kis tarah Behter taur pe anjaam de sakti hai Is sawal mein Bhoat sari mushkil hai Ek to lafz mansabi Aap ne istamal kiya hai جو آپ نے پتہ نہیں کونسی ڈکشنری سے نکال کے لیا ہے مجھے اتنی ہائی اردو نہیں آتی دائی کا فرض کیا ہے مجھے اتنا پتہ ہے ہاں انگلیش اوکے فائن what is the role of a دائی and how can women fulfill that role basically sorry my اردو ran out so here's the thing about being a دائی our دین we our job is not to be a دائی our job is to be a Muslim. Ibrahim alayhi salam gave us this deen, the name of this deen, and he said, رَبَّنَا وَجْعَلْنَا مُسْلِمَيْنِ لَكْ وَمِن ذُرِّيَّتِنَا أُمَّةً I'm not saying أُمَّةً دَعِيَةً قَالْ أُمَّةً مُسْلِمَةً Our role is to be a Muslim. Never lose that title. This is the title that we are proud of. Everything else, everything else is a peace of this one tree. Everything else is the fruit of this one tree. Your, life, your job in life is not to be a da'i, your job in life is to be a Muslim. Now, as a Muslim, you have lots of responsibilities. Some responsibilities you absolutely have to fulfill every single day. As a parent, I have responsibilities to my child. I have responsibilities to my parents. I have responsibilities to Allah for salah. I have responsibilities of earning. I have these responsibilities every day. And I have to fulfill them. 
and I have to try to do justice to all of them. For men, you have to give time to your wife, sorry, you have to give time to your children, you have to give time to your parents, you have to give time to Allah's house, the masjid, you have to give time to your job, you have to give time to your health, you have to give time to your learning, you have to give time to your friends. Oh my God, I ran out of time. <laughs> you have to give time to your rest. Yes or no? You have to give time to relax. You need it, you need to chill out and just do nothing, or do something stupid. You need time for that too. You need time for these things and you need to balance all of those things. And by the way, in the middle of all of that, you should make time to represent the deen of Allah as best you can. Now, does that mean you have to go on the street and do da'wah? If you have time, it's a nice thing to do. But if you don't have time, you are not missing an obligation. You are not missing an obligation. Allah did not tell every single Muslim to go out and do da'wah. Allah Azza wa Jal made that the, the responsibility of an ummah. And by the way, when you find that balance between all of those things, man, that is the greatest da'wah you will ever, ever do because the world is out of balance. Nobody knows how to balance their life. People do good in their career and they destroy their family. People take care of their family, they destroy their business. People take care of their children, ruin their marriage. People take care of their parents, forget about their kids. People take care of their kids, forget about their parents. There's all these imbalances. Who is supposed to represent balance? This Muslim. And when you have balance, people will say, hey, hey, where do you get this balance from? It's so nice. Well, it's from Islam. People will be attracted to this balance. Instead of giving people durus about balance, live it, be it. People should want to be like you. That's what we, you know, that's, that's the real obligation today. I'll tell you the extreme that's happening. I find it very disturbing. People want to study Quran, people want to study Hadith, and they want to study it eight hours a day. If you're studying that eight hours a day, your husband or your wife is not getting time from you. Your children are not getting time from you. You're not doing proper exercise. You're probably not eating healthy either. You're not making, you're not keeping connections with your relationships. Allah does not want you to study the Qur'an and forget about your life. This is not a service to Islam. This is imbalance. This is what the Qur'an came to correct. How can you read, sit there, reading Qur'an, and read, قُلْ سِيرُ فِي الْأَرْضِ What does سِيرُ فِي الْأَرْضِ mean? Go out in the land. And you're reading Tafsir ibn Kathir. مَاذَا قَالْ فِي سِيرُ فِي الْأَرْضِ الْقُرْتُبِي سِيرُ فِي الْأَرْضِ You know, قَالَ فُلَان وَفُلَان how about, ماذا قال الله? سيرو في الأرض Go take a walk. Go outside. Allah is telling you, take, you know, go travel. It will increase your iman. It will affect you. The book pushes you to go stop reading sometimes. And go experience. The best tafsir of أَوَلَمْ يَرَوْا إِلَى الطَّيْرِ فَوْقَهُمْ صَافَاتٍ وَيَقْبِضْنَا is not in a book. The best tafsir is where? In the sky. Go look. Go look. That's the tafsir of that ayah. So that is inshallah ta'ala. My, my voice is totally gone. I don't even know how I spoke today. I have a flight early in the morning. Technically, I'm already asleep. So <laughs> I'm going to stop talking now inshallah ta'ala and we'll enjoy some more wonderful announcements. And <laughs> I am going to... <laughs> It's only, it's only 12 more pages. It's only 12 more pages. Relax, easy, so easy. But uh, <laughs> I'm going to keep these questions, go through them, and when I get a chance, I'll try to answer them in some of my next durus and khutbahs, inshallah ta'ala. Thank you so very much, everybody. It's been a great pleasure being in Kuwait. Jazakumullah khairan. Assalamu alaikum wa rahmatullahi wa barakatuh.